we didn't know what we'd done. We didn't know what we'd started, but we knew it was good. And we knew that there were people who had not done what we'd done or been where we'd been that needed it and wanted it every bit as much as we did. And you, know, you get people like Rena Morris and you know, Rebecca and Scott Rohrman and, and all these other people that it wasn't something they were doing for Steven and I. Maybe, maybe at the inception that was part of it to say thank you. Um, but as it played out, it was something everyone needed. Everyone needed to tell each other who had carried them and who they were carrying. Right. The thing that's always struck me about you know carry the load and you know something that you guys have your thumbprint all over for obvious reasons is you, you made it you made it an event where everyone felt okay to be themselves. Yeah. You know you the the families who lost somebody felt welcome. The individuals who had served and lost a brother felt welcome. To me, it was a crossroads of so many people's journeys and gatherings. Your, you know, your initiative brought them all together and said, it's okay to be who I am. I think, and I've, you know, I think I've heard Clint say this a bunch, but this was started because you were doing it because you needed it. The event was started as a formalization of, hey, there's others, there's other vets that need this. I don't think what was anticipated was the reaction from the non from the non veteran and just how naturally all that coalesced. And, and I think it really came down to the, the, the fellowship between those two groups that was wholly unintended that was was the magic thereof. Well, was it truly unintended, though? I, I would tell you that... You, well, well... I mean, because well, the, well, I you, think you wanted that, to make Memorial Day matter again. That, right. that was a big deal. Right, but, but year one, you look at our you know, you, you look at our sign-up like two weeks out. You know, like 48 people signed up and like two-thirds of them were related to Steven. <laughs> But and he looked at me. He's like, "Hey, man, we're doing this. You and my family, we're doing this, right?" <laughs> uh, well, it, we thought if it's just us, it's just yeah, us. Yeah. And then, and I'll never forget going into 2012 when we moved the event from White Rock Lake to River Sean in this lot larger venue. Going, it's going to look really empty if, if yeah, it, yeah, if, if if no one comes and, and people showed up in droves and droves it struck a nerve an order of magnitude and the and the, and the brilliance and it was really steven and rebecca that had, had, had wanted to move to revishon park and i wasn't opposed to it i just didn't understand it but i remember steven making a point one time and i, I kind of got it uh strategically but not but the, the, the point he made is like hey when we're doing a white rock everybody's going all the way around right when you're on revishon people are passing uh, and, 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 and I, that was that let's get that to rebecca Okay, well, you told me. Well, like, she, like I, I heard it from you, so maybe, maybe so, so. But I'm scared of Rebecca too. Like I'm, <laughs> I agree. I'm, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not opposing that. I'm just saying you, you're the one who told me. But you know what? That that exchange right there yeah. is I'm, so who y'all are. Yeah, and I'm scared. Give, of give the credit too. to other people because it was a brilliant move. Well, and the other thing to add to Stephen's point, that I think was amazing, is I, I, I needed, and the way I've said this for years is like my friend thought you were dying for, and he didn't even know you. And I need you to remember him on the one day you're supposed to. Otherwise, him, even though you don't know him, even though or is dying for you won't make sense to me. I need it to make sense to me. So there was an element of I needed those sacrifices to be recognized. I need those sacrifices to be recognized by the families of the, what I didn't fully understand and appreciate. So really, that first one, Revachon, is how I mean the participation has always been skewed heavily in favor of just great American citizens and families that wanted to participate, right? Yes. And there's a magic in that willingness to endure pain for a person you didn't even know that was was healing for me at a at a at a at a magnitude and velocity that I didn't anticipate. And I began to use that and, and I would find these angriest guys I know and I would kind of deliberately shape a scenario where early in the morning they're on the road and they're mad. And I, I point to this wonderful 60-year-old banker that's never done anything in this, his entire life this hard. And like, hey, he's carrying your friend right now. 
and he's been walking on this is the furthest he's ever gone the most way he's ever carried and he's not going to stop because he wants you to know that your friend mattered to him but he doesn't know your friend so go tell him about your friend and you'd see this magic happen between the angry veteran and the appreciative citizen and they would just walk together and and there would be this because i think a seed a lot of a seed a lot of my anger at least was thinking people didn't care but man you you can't it is impossible to believe that people don't care after an event like Carrie Love. Like you just, you can't with any sense of integrity and honesty tell yourself people don't care that you lost your friend after you go there. Well, and, and I think that's a really interesting point and, and something you said a minute ago, Stephen, kind of triggered this thought in me too. It, it It's not that people don't care, as yeah. you said. It's not that, that people didn't believe Memorial Day was important. Mm -hmm. What y'all have done with this event is you've shown people how to care. People have always cared, yeah. but they didn't know how to care. So what did they do? They did what everybody else does on Memorial Day. They go, they go, uh, you know, they, they go to a backyard barbecue. And I want to kind of shift gears to that because I've heard you both use this. It was born out of anger. Yeah. And then I've also heard you both talk about, I'm not as angry as I used to be. Oh man, I didn't notice this till about the third year, but I found myself walking less and less and visiting more and more. And at first I thought that was a kind of function of someone being a host, right? Hey, I gotta, you know, I'm a hosting, right? That's part of my responsibility here and, and, and discovering and kind of facilitating yeah. things. But then as I sat back and I looked about it, I was like, I don't know that I need to walk as much as I used to anymore. Like I kind of, like the seed of that you know, going 40, 50 miles as hard as you can with as much as you can, like, that wasn't there as much anymore for all the right reasons, right? I, I, I processed it through kind of pain and keeping pace with guys like Steven and you and, and, and Chick and, and all these people. And um, so I found, I, it's like you, you bleed off that water pressure, right? And you bring that boiler back under control by bleeding off steam. And I think for, for us, that's fundamentally part of why we wanted to do it is we knew, we knew, and you, you know, as, as a Marine Corps veteran, like you can exhaust yourself to a better place. You can, I mean, there's therapy with physical exhaustion for the right purpose. But it was interesting to me, I found myself not only walking less every year on the aggregate, but uh, not needing to, and then being very tactical and deliberate about when I go up and walk and, and just being down in base camp and, and enjoying base camp and celebrating the stories that I get to hear and just listening to people. And because I've told my stories, right? And, and, and enough people had heard them that I, I just didn't, I feel like everybody already knew about, you know, Jason and, and some of the guys that we lost and, and just listening. And, and so, yeah, I mean, it kind of did its, I'd love to claim the genius of designing a program that uh, helped me process that anger and frustration. But it was more of this, um, I didn't know you could exhaust it. And it's not totally exhausted. That's, but on that day, it is. Like on, on, on that day, when you see 20,000 people there on a three-day weekend in Dallas, Texas during lake season, and they're there, and not only are they there, it's become the way that their family does things. And not only has it become the way their family does things, but they have family that fly in and do that, right? You, it's it's hard to stay mad when you see that, right? So, a couple of times I've been out on the relay, and I, I've seen the same person a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. And you know, and it's fun catching up with them. It's yeah. you know, a year goes by, but it's like it was yesterday. Yeah. You know, and then when you get off the relay and into uh, you know base camp at the memorial uh, yeah. march, you know, it's it's a it's a community. I mean, it's people gathering that hadn't seen one another for for a while. Yeah, but, it was the reunion. But. Tell me your fondest memory, story from the relay. Steven, I'm gonna start with you. We don't have enough time right. to, to recount the number of... Maybe the first favorite moment. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. There's, there's too many, and a lot of them are very emotional for me. But the, the, the first memory that I have is, um, Year one, mm -hmm. 2012, getting a call from Coleman. Coleman Ruiz. Coleman Ruiz, who was, 
who, who is, the hastily placed executive director. Who is orchestrating. Hey, what are, you, what are you doing for the next year? I don't know. I got some ideas. And I forget exactly where he was, but he, he was coming out of the Northeast. He was coming out of New York City, and he was getting close to Knoxville, Tennessee. And he said, I don't have much sign up really over this next three or four days. And he said, I've been walking and I need help. And I said, all right, I'm coming. And a good friend of mine, by the name of Pryor Blackwell, okay. called me that same weekend, it was Mother's Day weekend. And he said, what are you doing? And I tried to articulate what I was about to go to do. This relay going on, my buddy's walking, he's about to get into Knoxville, he needs help. He said, I'm coming with you. And we- and He had no idea what he was getting into. Not much of one. He knew it was purposeful. He knew it was purposeful. He knew it was veteran related. I don't think he knew how much walking. <laughs> We may have consistently underrepresented the. the I'm starting the, to see a pattern with you two. No, come on, it's fun. You'll, you'll do it. And uh, you hit this halfway mark, and I, well, I gotta finish now. It's more efficient to go backwards. He knew what carry the load was 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 about, the spirit of. But what he heard me say was, my buddy, who's walking in honor of the men and women who've made the ultimate sacrifice, needs help. And. I'm, I'm going to walk and he immediately said I'm, I'm coming with you and so we packed up some groceries we went up there we met Coleman a little before midnight uh, in the middle of nowhere Tennessee and we started walking and talking it was great weather at the time too wasn't it it was great weather and we walked for about eight straight hours it was a great I'm weather taking, I'm it taking that it weather, was, yeah. that was a little sarcastic yeah. What, what kind of weather are we talking about here? Biblical. Driving, Biblical. Driving rainstorm. Where Biblical we, driving rain. We yeah. had headlamps and there was periods of time where you couldn't see two, I mean, the, amount, the volume of water was pretty incredible. But we walked for eight straight hours that first night. And um, I'll, at, at the end of that, those eight hours, I remember thinking, here's an individual who has no, who didn't serve, um, but heard that call for help from Coleman and immediately said, I'm in. And so th th that's when I, I think one of the first times I started to realize the, 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 the people out there that maybe didn't have that direct connection, but they cared. Yeah, and Pryor's a man of action and he wanted you to know that it mattered what mattered to you mattered to him you bet and he didn't want to, to use a navy term he didn't want me going up there without a swim buddy mm. right and it tie that was in tennessee well i believe it was the next year we were walking in memphis we had he had such a profound experience the next year he said i'm coming back with you and so we were in memphis and I remember we'd walked uh, most of the day through Memphis. Took a leg or two off, but we were coming off, and it was really hot afternoon. And we were coming off um, a couple of five mile legs, and we planned to take a leg off. And um, we were at a Memphis fire department, and we're sitting there, and I'm Forget who the leg captain was, but was getting ready to, was getting the flags ready, was getting the walkers ready, and we're sitting and a, a lady and a young man, boy at the time, walked onto the bus, and this kid was wearing his arm, uh, his dad's army army cap, uniform, fatigue cap, mm -hmm. and um, we started talking a little bit of small talk you know how'd you hear about us and they heard about us through we're a snowball family snowball express heard of, heard about you through buck kern and why are you here and she essentially said you know i something to the effect of there's people out here who haven't forgotten my husband and his father's ultimate sacrifice mm -hmm. 
and I, w I want him to be a part of it. So, <laughs> Friar and I look at each other, trying to hold it together. At least I was. I said, "All right, let's go. We're we're going we're going another five, and we're in and." and um, I'll never forget about a quarter mile into that leg, we're going through a construction zone. And at this point, we're just getting to know this, this mother and this son. And um, we're going through this construction zone and this big, huge, burly construction superintendent looks out because we had a police escort, fire escort, and we're coming right through the middle of his job site. And he keeps looking and he keeps looking and he finally steps out and says, what are you guys doing? And I forget, it, it, it was one of the, it was one of the, the, the ABAC kids, the leg mm. captains, that was able to very articulately and succinctly tell them, we're walking to Dallas in honor of our, our military and our first responders and those who've made the ultimate sacrifice. And he looked over and in fact, he, he pointed to this widow and her son, and this big, burly superintendent walked over and gave her the biggest bear hug, and just water works out of his eyes. And so it, that was another very profound experience for me to see these two strangers have this immediate connection, and for her to see mm. that reaction from a stranger about um, what we were doing and why we were doing it. And um, again, very, very profound experience for me amongst dozens and dozens and dozens out on the relay. I want you to think about the way this thing has really almost come full circle from the initial march around yeah. White Rock Lake. Yeah. To where we are today, and yeah. I want you to—I I, just—I want you to think about this, and I want to hear your comments to how much of an impact you've had on how many people. So this starts with you just packing a backpack full of weights in honor of the buddies you lost, and you're going around the lake. And this gentleman says something to you: the tumblers fell into place. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here we are, 2020, COVID-19. People are actually calling our office saying, please don't let this die. We still need leadership. We still need guidance. And now you got people doing exactly what you were doing, but now they're doing it with a purpose. Mm. And they're walking by themselves. They're posting it on social media. Do you have any idea the impact that you two have had on society? I don't think I'll ever truly realize the, the the impact, but there's there's an awareness there that that we've we've touched a lot of lives, and we've done. Um, you haven't just touched lives, Stephen. Y'all have helped heal. Well, well, that's a big difference. I I I, I think we've affected a lot of people across the country and you know <laughs> I think early early on in some board meetings with with Clint and I and and, and Aaron and Scott and um, and the discussions around the money that we raised and for me personally it was always that was so important mm. from <laughs> it was so important for me and you're laughing because We've had a lot of discussions around money, but to see the amount of money that we've raised and the the dozens and dozens and dozens of organizations across the United States yeah. who've benefited from that, and those their constituents ultimately that benefited from that is something that I'm extremely proud of. Yeah, I think that's something that resonates kind of deeply inside 
you know, Steve and I coming out of the special operations community where at the end of the day, you're, you're a force multiplier. Hey, I try to make your 210, right? And so our deal was to, um, and this is a part of the mission that Steven stayed just relentlessly focused on, which is really how you move the needle in that a lot of times in the philanthropic community, the most passionate Okay, the person is sometimes the founder, right? So that founder is either on the X solving the problem that they started the whole thing to solve, or they're pulling off the X trying to raise resources and attract attention. And we come out of a world where like, you keep your best problem solvers on the fight. Like if you got a great sniper, the worst thing you do is have them come off the line and get more bullets. Like you take them what they need to solve the problem they're uniquely gifted and, and capable of, of solving. And so it, it, to have that exponential impact, to be a force multiplier was something Steven would always kind of bring me back to and bring us back to. And, and that's where kind of the measurables, a lot of the measurables are. And when you look at it in the totality of that, it's really neat to say how I'm part of this story. But I don't want to look at it as a debt that's got to be paid, right? Because how do you, how do you, how do you prove yourself worth the time of the person you miss who has no more time, right? And so I, I love being part of an amazing story. Um, but I don't want, I don't want anybody to, I mean, it's, it's not done. Like the mission's not done. It's and, not, you know. And I've thought about this year coming full circle, just in, in, with the events of COVID-19 over the last, whatever it's been, 60 days, roughly. You can't turn on the TV without being reminded of what sacrifice looks like yeah. every single day across uh, not only across this country, but you know, uh, across the world, we we wanted to recognize that service and sacrifice. That that's the reason why we started it, and here we are, ten years later, and unfortunately, we're not able to to have the community and the fellowship and the the that human interaction this year. But because of COVID nineteen, there's there's a greater awareness, I believe of what service and sacrifice looks like because of that direct connection that everyone has mm. in some way, shape, or form, you know? Yeah, well, it's impacting far more people yes. now. There are far more people being asked to stay home. There's a sacrifice there, and, and however small it is, people can now, you know, start to relate, oh, this is what sacrifice means. So I understand exactly and, what you're saying. And when saying. you see, you know, you can't help but turn on pictures, you know, when you turn on the news and see what, um, see what that service and sacrifice looks like um, for people to now, in, hopefully put two and two together that our military across the world, day in, day out, puts their life on the line just like you know, our first responders are doing in the midst of this national crisis right now. So we've, here we are 10 years after it started. And for a couple of years, it was just a matter of, hey, let's just get to the next year. Let's just get to yeah. It's caught on. It's here. The passion you've created in everyone, it's here to stay. In the end though, what does what does true success for this organization, what does true success for this movement, what does it really look like? Success is to remain on mission, and success is to remain unforgotten. Success is to have a season life where you can't remember not doing Memorial Day well, right? I mean, if you think about the number 10 years, like we're in this generational, there's a generation of kids not friends of mine, friends of yours. This is a generation of kids that this is, they don't they don't remember. My daughters don't remember. My daughters don't remember not doing Memorial Day well. They don't. They've always done it well, and they, they don't know anybody who doesn't do it well. And to like success for me is not remembering when you didn't do Memorial Day well, and not remembering when you didn't honor the sacrificial service as well, and not remembering when. Um, Respect and remembrance and honor and acknowledgement wasn't something you just did. Like, if you take a hill, the worst thing you do is lose it, right? So for me, success is keeping that hill and just not remembering a time when you don't remember. Um, that's kind of what the, that's not a new definition of success though, that's always been it, is to 
restore the true meaning of Memorial Day and extend that branch of recognition to the other sacrificial services and to not remember a time when you didn't do that well. And we have a generation of, of young leaders in America that don't remember not doing this well. And that's pretty cool. The fact that we'll be in at least 45 different states, we'll have four different relays ongoing, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, Mountain States, over 15,000 miles covered. Um, we've already gone over $25 million raised. So who knows what that number looks like after our 10 year anniversary. I think we're just scratching the surface. And so for the potential to impact lives and for the potential to impact that next generation exponentially across this country is what really uh, is exciting for me. So it started as just a little pebble dropping in the water. The ripple effects of this are continuing. And I, I, what I want to point out to you guys, and the, the amazing thing to me is the humility that you guys have approached this thing with. I mean, y'all are quick to give everyone else all the credit in the world. And it's because of your leadership and it's because of that humility and who cares who gets the credit for what. That's why this organization is where it is. And all anyone wants to do is make a difference and feel like they're, they're a part of something special. I know for me personally, y'all gave me Y'all gave me purpose again to be a part of something that meant something. And on behalf of a lot of people, thank you. You've made a difference in a lot of lives. Well, I mean, the right thing to say is you're welcome. Um, uh, and, I, and I'll say that because 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 that's sincere and I'm grateful for those words, but I, you know, I. I tell you, every year you reload and you try to find a way to keep doing it again, and, and then you see someone like you who just showed up. And I mean, I just I remember I remember the first time I saw you at Carry Load and what it was doing to you, and the fuel that that gave me. So I mean, I I think it's pretty easy for Stephen and I to say you're welcome, but also to say thank you to you and Debbie and Aback and Dill and man, I don't know that y'all ever. I don't know that y'all ever, and I'm, I, when words fail me, that should tell you something, right? But I, don't, but I don't know that I can ever fully articulate the gift that Carrie Lowe has been to me. And all these people, and doing it with Steven, and, and um, I mean, it's, that is, a, that is a tenfold gift that I think we've enjoyed as much or maybe more than anybody else. Um, I, the way I describe transitions, sometimes there's a difference between being here and all the way home. Here is uh, geography. It's a place on a map. Home is knowing why you're here. And I tell you, for years I was here but not home. And for me, carry the load, the volunteers, the the staff, the, the I mean, the it's just it's 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 brought me home, and. Um, and I'm forever grateful for what Carrie Lloyd has, has, has done to and for me and my family to, to, to be a guy that's home now because of this movement that is so much bigger than Stephen or I. So, no, thank you as well. And, Stephen, thanks for starting this with me. I, I, it's fun to see the season that it's in right now and, and I see the spectacular leadership that, that's at the helm and how so many other collaborative missions have been built into this. It's amazing to see. Um, it's amazing to see what it is now. I mean, I think the best thing you can ever do is build into something that uh, can take on its own life and, and, you know, Stephen and the board and you and all these other things. It's, it's just this... I get to take a really great exhale every Memorial Day because I get to see people better than me doing stuff I don't know how to do. And all for the same reason and the same mission. And producing reconciliation and peace and comfort at a scale that I, I don't know that I could have ever really envisioned, right? So, so I'll see your thank you and I'll raise you. Well, I thank you, I thank you for the inspiration 
that you gave me, I want to I want to forever thank you for that because without that, um, who knows? <laughs>